Wilbur wasn't the only brother caught in the limelight. Catherine, I haven't done a lick of work since I've been here. I have to give my time to answering the 10,000 fool questions people ask about the machine. In the next few weeks at a Washington, D.C. Army base called Fort Myer, Orville broke record after record, flying higher and longer than Wilbur had flown, culminating in a spectacular flight of 70 minutes. To meet the terms of their army contract, Orville had to demonstrate that their plane could carry a passenger. One day, he took off with a young Signal Corps officer, Lieutenant Thomas Selfridge. They were making a circuit of the field when Orville heard two loud thumps. He caught the motor and tried to land, but the plane went into a nosedive. Selfridge murmured, oh, oh, almost inaudibly. The flyer crashed straight into the ground pinning Orville and Selfridge beneath the wreckage. Orville was hospitalized with several broken ribs and a serious back injury. Selfridge's skull had been fractured, and he died that evening, the first person ever to be killed in a powered airplane. Catherine, I cannot help thinking over and over again. If I had been there, it would not have happened. The death of poor Selfridge was a greater shock to me than Orville's injuries, severe as they were. It took four months for Orville to recover. When he was well enough, he sailed with Catherine across the Atlantic to join Wilbur in France. They traveled south to the town of Pau, where Wilbur flew before a steady procession of notables who came from all over Europe. Princes and millionaires are as thick as fleas, he said. People were struck, I think, by several things at once. Uh, they were struck by the extent to which uh, Wilbur and Orville Wright and Catherine as well were unpretentious, straightforward, uh, honest, down-to-earth Americans, as it were. At the same time, I think they were struck by their sophistication, too. Catherine seemed to enjoy all the attention but her brothers couldn't wait to get home. Wilbur wrote, Father, almost every evening a crowd of two or three thousand people comes out to see if I will make a flight. I sometimes get so angry at the continual annoyance of having the crowd about, but I cannot help feeling sorry for them when I do not go out. If I can get through this season, I am done with demonstrations forever. In Berlin, they flew before the Kaiser. In Rome, the Wright brothers were greeted as heroes by the royal family. Their father kept track of their activities from Dayton. Enjoy fame, ere its decadence, for I have realized the emptiness of its trumpet blasts. But it was out of the bishop's hands. Milton Wright's two youngest sons were among the first great celebrities of the 20th century. On one of his last flights in Rome, Wilbur brought along a photographer who shot the first motion pictures from an airplane. Four months after this flight, a Frenchman flew across the English Channel in a plane with control features based on the Wright's wing-warping design. The age of flight had arrived, and newcomers on both sides of the Atlantic began taking to the air. Back in Dayton, the brothers established the Wright Company in 1909 to manufacture airplanes. Orville managed the business. Wilbur was consumed with protecting their patents, filing lawsuit after lawsuit, taking infringers to court. In 1912, on a trip to Boston, Wilbur became ill with typhoid. He returned to Hawthorne Street and died three weeks later. He was 45 years old. The bishop wrote a tribute to his son. An unfailing intellect, 
imperturbable temper, great self-reliance, and as great modesty, seeing the right clearly, pursuing it steadfastly, he lived and died. After Wilbur's death, Orville lost interest in the Wright Company and in 1915 sold it along with their patents for $1 million. He retired to Hawthorne Hill, the Dayton mansion he and Wilbur had started to build. He lived with Milton and Catherine until his father died and his sister married at the age of 52. As the elder statesman of aviation, Orville would find it necessary to spend much of his time ensuring that he and his brother received the credit they deserved. They saw something they wanted to do and they just did it. And if they didn't know the answer, they found other means to get the answer. The spirit of, of not being afraid of just going ahead and doing whatever had to be done is something that I, I uh, admire tremendously. One morning in January 1948, when he was 76 years old, Orville had a heart attack while fixing a doorbell at Hawthorne Hill. He died three days later with his family around him. A production of WGDH Boston. Major funding for the American experience is provided by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to enhance public understanding of the role of technology in American society and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the annual financial support of viewers like you. And by miracle Grow Plant Food for flowers, for vegetables, whatever you grow. A gardener's true friend is miracle Grow. The American Experience was made possible by generations of Americans. Funding for this program was made possible by American Express.